Oh, God, good, you're here. I am so excited. Guess what? Uh, I hope this isn't about your podcast again. Why? Did you finally listen to it? Da 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 The Grooming Next Door Production. The 1970s and 80s had elbow, gravy train, perina, meow mix, and bell bottoms. You've changed your clothes, now change how you feed your pet. Like bell bottoms, kick the kibble and join us in the 21st century with the healthiest diet for dogs and cats. Feed naturally, feed raw, feed fetching foods. You're listening to BYOTP Radio. Coming up next, the Groomer Next Door. Hello, pups and kittens, and welcome to another fun-filled and informative episode of the Groomer Next Door podcast. I'm your host, Chris Green. Joining us this week is Aaron Coogan. Aaron is an absolute doll who has so much experience training not only the dogs, but pet parents. She has done so much, including compete in the Westminster Kennel Club, and has won with her dog, Zero. It's actually really, really amazing to be able to talk to somebody who has been there. I have never had that fortunate side. And we're going to be lucky enough to learn a little bit about a really cool breed called the Ridgeback. This would have never happened if it wasn't for our good friend, Troy Allison of Fetching Foods. He was the one who said, you got to interview her. She's wonderful. And you know what? He's right. Well, let's get into our fact of the week. Because we're talking about the Westminster Kennel Club, I thought, you know what, the fact of the week would be fun to go into that. Westminster predates the invention of the light bulb, the automobile, and the building of the Brooklyn Bridge and the Washington Monument. The invention of basketball, the establishment of the World Series. The first telecast of the Westminster Kennel Club was in 1948. That was three years before I Love Lucy premiered. Man, that's a massive, massive competition that has definitely got some longevity. I really thought that was kind of cool. Well, by that sound, Erin is about to make her way into the podcast studio. So with that said, welcome Erin Coogan to the podcast. Oh, hello. Hold on a sec. Dad, we have a guest on the podcast. This week on the podcast, I have to first say thank you to Troy Allison of Fetching Foods to, for making this happen. Erin Coogan, who actually is amazing when it comes to the Rhodesian Ridgeback. She is the, probably one of the most knowledgeable people possible, and she has a great story. Thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you about Ridgeback. I'm I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about this specific breed because like I told you before we started, I don't ever get to see them. So to learn a little bit more about the actual breed, their temperament, what it's like to do what you do, it's going to be interesting. So let's go into your origin story, where it all began, because that's the best place to always start. <laughs> Well, it all began one day. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> um, so when I was in college, my boyfriend, now husband, bought me a standard poodle, hmm. which I'm sure you see a ton of mm-hmm. in your room shop. And um, after we'd had him for, oh, nine or ten months, I realized uh, I have no idea how to train this dog. 
he's an amazing dog. I don't want anything to happen to him, but I couldn't figure out how to get him to not run out the front door, uh, you know, not go out in the road. You know, obviously, if we kept him on a leash, that would help, but I just didn't know where to start. And I was lucky enough to, um, back in the days when people put advertisements in the paper newspaper, um, I found a lady who was willing to help me with some in-home dog training, and uh, it was a life changer for me. And by the time we were done with our, you know, we did a few weeks, a uh, number of sessions, she said, you know, I think that you might be interested in doing competitive obedience, which is competition obedience, and there is a dog training school here, we live in Utah, um, called Lead Me On Dog Training, and um, I think we should, she wanted to do it as well, um, go take some classes. And um, it, it really did strike my fancy. I was really interested in it. Um, of course, with standard poodles being very compliant and, and um, easily trained, um, we were able to get some obedience titles. Um, but heading back to the Ridgebacks, I met my uh, best friend, Jolyn Myers, in uh, these obedience classes, and she had a Rhodesian Ridgeback. He was a pain in the butt. He was um, free thinking. He would test her all the time. He wasn't very compliant. Um, you know, one of those dogs that you're like, well, I'm glad I don't own that dog. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but she worked with him, and she actually got obedience titles on him. And um, she then obtained another Ridgeback. And uh, over the course of about two years, uh, we became close friends, and uh, this was in the early 90s. And when she did a, a breeding, she bred her second Ridgeback that she got. The first one was uh, a neutered male, but the second one was a show dog. And um, she uh, bred a litter, and she said, hey, are you interested in helping me get these puppies trained to be show dogs? And I said, um, all right, yeah, I can do that. You know, I was a kid, but what do I know? And I grew to know them better and understand it wasn't them being a jerk. It wasn't that they didn't want to do things. They were just extra smart, and they got bored. Mm -hmm. So when they were bored with the activity, they'd act out and find something else to do. Gotcha. So, um, right. So that's when I started becoming interested in the rich back. Not that I didn't love my standard poodle, and by that time I actually had acquired a second standard poodle and was continuing with the um, obedience trials. Um, but I kept this, you know, little underlying interest in Ridgebacks going through my friendship with Jolyn. And um, when, after, you know, doing it a few more years, I was like, you know, I think I want to have one of these of my own. So that was... That's how it all started. It started in obedience class, and I didn't go out looking for a Ridgeback. It's funny. They found me. It's funny how that works. You don't think it's going to be something that you're going to just dive into head first, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> I, know Absolutely. I know that feeling all too well. Um, so, I always like to ask one question early on following the origin story, and that is soapbox moments. Um, I, of course, mine is always when it comes to food and nutrition, but I'm always interested in what other people's soapbox moments are. And so that's where the next question is, what is your soapbox moment? This would be like jumping way ahead in my interest in reachbacks and, and just my um, experience in, you know, dog training and then showing dogs and handling dogs for other people, but, um, you know, taking responsibility for your actions. And obviously, I mean, that crosses everything, not just dogs, but if you are a dog owner, cat owner, horse owner, you have to be responsible for them, their actions, how they affect everybody around you in your community, and take responsibility. Um, in the amount of rescue that I've done over the last 20 years, generally, it, I'm cleaning up after other people. Whether it was a bad breeder who didn't take precautions um, in making sure that they were um, only breeding sound dogs about health, 
um, issues and then dumping those dogs on somebody because they had the money to buy them um, and then those people aren't capable of taking care of a sick dog or not requiring somebody, um, again, if you're a breeder, not requiring somebody to go to obedience classes and make sure that their dog becomes a good citizen. Um, Rescue always has to step in and clean up those messes. And that's really been a big soapbox for me. If you're going to be involved in the dog community, you have to be able to say, I can be a responsible person. Um, if not, just step back. Quit it. I could. Because I, I, I always have to. Yeah, I have to, I have to step in all the time. i got to clean up your mess. Not my responsibility, but... Because I love my breed, um, I do. And I've been doing it for a long time. So there's my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> I like your soapbox. Um, being part of a nonprofit as well, I, I see that too. Except I see it with all breeds of dogs and cats. And, you know, being in Missouri, we are, I, I would still say we're still number one for um, puppy mills, backyard breeders. And so I can completely yeah. relate. I mean, these people will just, in the most deplorable conditions possible, have these dogs, and they will produce and produce and produce, and they will sell them off and say, oh, they're purebred, and they have all kinds of issues, and unsuspected people are going, um, I can't afford those kind of vet bills, this is a puppy, but you just kind of go, oh my god, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, that's a rough one. Now, you say the word good citizen, and I love it. And being in training, I completely understand what you're saying. Because people look at dogs and go, they're just property. That's another, I'm sure you hear that, and I'm sure that drives you nuts because it does me. They're a life, they're not property. Yeah. They're our companion, they're not our iPad. Um, and I guess I treat my iPad pretty well, so guess I couldn't really say that, but some people don't. But, <laughs> but you know, I, I love the fact that, you know, you address good citizen. You know, these dogs need to have a certain stature about them. They have to be obedient, like a good person. And I love the fact that you use the word good citizen because you've put them into a category of being humanized, and they should be. And the accountability, I get that. Because you are training not the dog, you're training the pet parent, which I don't think a lot of people understand that. Yeah, they, you know, you can think that a dog is just your property, just like the cows out in the field or whatever, but rich pets are property with big teeth. <laughs> I like that. And you know, it's, your insurance company doesn't care why your dog bit somebody. They don't care if, you know, there was an underlying problem. It happened. And in our society, we don't have room for those kinds of mistakes. Of course, it continues to happen. But again, if you make an effort to have your dog be a good citizen, they can walk down the street and not be a problem. You can have someone come to your door without fear of something, you know, awful happening, or a child can approach your dog unexpectedly and, you know, something horrendous doesn't ensue. That, to me, is a dog that is a good citizen. They don't have to be perfect at sitting. They don't have to be perfect at lying down or stay. They just need to understand, with your guidance, that... You know, life is okay. <laughs> we can we can get through, and with some training, um, you know, you can be safe. Everybody can be safe. And you know what, what drives me absolutely insane? Again, I'm probably still in soapbox mode, but the fact that there's such a prejudice when it comes to specific breeds. Any dog yeah. that has a good, strong jawline is automatically a threat. Whether it's a shepherd, it's a pit bull, it's a ridgeback. Chihuahua. Well, chihuahuas can be very vicious. I'm not going to lie. They, yeah. The smaller dogs are more likely to bite than the bigger dogs. And, right. and their teeth are big. Oh, they are. Oh, they are so... And yeah. That was my first bite. My first bite was a chihuahua. It wasn't a German Shepherd. It wasn't a pit bull. 
you ever get so right. tired of a good breed that really any dog can be vicious if abused and treated that way and taught only to hate? Yeah. Don't you hate that, that stereotype that's attached to them? Yeah, it's... It's pretty ridiculous. Uh, and, uh, you know, you feel like there's days when you feel like people are starting to get over the hump. They're realizing, you know what, this is a human problem, not a dog problem. But And then they just backslide based on whatever's, you know, on the media or maybe experience that they've had. But we try, we just, you know, you push, push forward and try and help people understand this is you, you're causing this, you got to work harder. Um, but it just it ends up backsliding and, and falling on the shoulders, unfortunately, of the dog. And people just forget their dogs. And that drives me nuts. I mean, you got a three-year-old child yeah. that walks on all four and has fur. That's what you got right there. Can you just realize Absolutely. that? Treat them like that. They're, they feel pain. They feel emotion. I, yeah. So in rescue, right. um, one thing that I always wanted to know, and, and especially with Utah, because I'm not, I haven't been to Utah, and I, I'm not completely um, aware of different things that are going on. How many sure. rescues do you actually get because of abuse? Um, you know, I'll be honest. Um, it's generally not abuse in the physical sense, you know, in terms of beating up. It's generally more neglect or lack of uh, responsibility in training and management. Um, I, I will say with all honesty that I've been lucky enough to uh, not have to take in and rehabilitate a dog that has had any sort of severe, um, you know, Injuries or anything like that due to being, uh, you know, beat or seriously neglected. That goes to um, I think that. Go ahead, sorry. That goes to the simple fact that you're on the west coast. Once we, I've always said this, when you're on either coast, there is a different mindset. There's a different approach to things. Once you get into that middle ground, it's still 20, 25 years behind that. Drives me insane. Well, yeah, that'd be hard to stomach. Uh, if I had to deal with that in rescue on a regular basis, I, I think I'd be a little bit disheartened. <laughs> um, humans can be cruel, and we always see the things crop up on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you know, about the, the seizures of huge puppy mills and, and the deplorable conditions that the dogs have been kept in, and that happens here. And uh, most recently, I saw a, a huge 95 dog seizure in Northern California of Malamutes, and, mm-hmm. and um, sadly, they're all, uh, all the puppies have been stricken with parvo, and, mm-hmm. and so unfortunately, again, the, the rescue, is, it falls on the shoulders of the rescue mm-hmm. from the Humane Society to clean up the mess, and um, I, that would be taxing. I, I, I don't think I could handle that on a regular basis. Um, Stitch backs are difficult enough to rehab when they get themselves in the mindset of I can do whatever I want and look at how big and muscly I am and it'll happen. Um, Working through that is hard enough, but if I had to deal with them being like mentally challenged or abused, that would be quite difficult to deal with. Yeah. At least at least that breed is is not. Um, I can see my wife being vastly um, bred just because, again, here you have a very strong jaw dog who, unfortunately, yeah. they have to ha- it has to be worked. You can't just have that yeah. kind of dog sitting around. It has to do something or you're, it's going to lose its mind. Yeah. Well, and this, this situation was actually malamutes. I apologize if I um, misspoke. But, you know, cute, fluffy dog that everybody thinks is great. But, they, again, they grow big. They have a ton of hair. They need a mm. ton of training. They're free thinking. Yeah. It's it, just, there's, there's lots of bad things out there. <laughs> well, but you got a dog that actually needs to be groomed. And, and again, I, I'll, I'll fall down on that side of it. And here you go with people go, oh, it's so cute. But it requires work. It's not. It's not just a right. cute dog that you can just wait four, six, eight weeks and take it to the girl and go, okay, make it look nice, but not too short. It's yep. cold. Well, you didn't brush the dog. I mean, it's got mats. Yeah. These mats are to the skin. It's 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 frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm probably on one today, I guess. Um, 
sorry. I'm sorry if I, uh, you know, no, okay, I'm sorry if I brought it out. No, 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 it's, it's all good. I mean, you know, again, when it comes to, to dogs, I, I, and cats, I, I get really passionate when it comes to the abuse side. And there's so much to it that it just drives me absolutely insane. And so I'm like, you know, come on, we need to have better awareness to these things. And I guess that's what this whole podcast has always been about is, unfortunately, yeah. unveiling it. Um, so let's get into some happier sides. So you, okay. started, <laughs> you started to actually do competition. And I kind of yeah. want to start at the origin to that. How did that all become? Okay. Because you've gone all the way up to the biggest championship reigns possible, and I just love that that whole background. So start us off at the beginning. How did that all become part of your life? <laughs> um, well, are you talking about just the dog showing part, or um, with the competition, like obedience trial? Wherever you want to start. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, I'm a firm believer in if you have a hobby or something that you're passionate about, you know, do it right. Do what makes you happy. And there are certainly days that I feel like I only go to my job so that then I can go do my favorite thing in life, which is dogs, dog showing, and even dog grooming. I have a Tibetan Mastiff as well, um, and so that she requires a ton of brushing. Mm -hmm. And um, those so those sorts of things make me happy. And so once I started doing competitive obedience, like, and competitive obedience um, is, when I was doing it at full throttle, there wasn't agility and all the, well, what I consider the more fun activities that there are now. Um, competitive obedience uh, initially was your dog is judged on a scale of 200 points. Um, they go through a healing pattern on leash, off leash. They do a figure eight around people. Um, they're required to do um, a sit stay across the ring, come to you, sit in front, then get into heel position. Um, doesn't seem too difficult, but when you get into a competition setting and you start feeling a little bit nervous, then your dog looks at you like, what's wrong with you? You know, when you start getting caught in mouth and that sort of a thing. Um, and, but again, starting with standard poodles, who, like I said, are very compliant, and I'll use a comparison to the Ridgeback temperament in a minute, but um, they, they liked it. They liked the repetition. They were interested in being a part of that relationship with me, obviously, and I with them. I didn't have children at the time. And um, it was just a really fun activity. To, and I'm a little bit competitive by nature, so um, just something that really stuck for me. And um, when I became friends with the gal that I had referred to before, Jillian, and she got me interested in helping her do dog shows with her Ridgebacks, I just took it as another training um, facet, right? So now I'm training the dogs. They need to stand for exam. They need to be approached by a stranger. The stranger may look in their mouths. Um, the stranger may look in their ears, run their hands down their tail, check their testicles. Things that for somebody like you, a groomer, you appreciate, right? You love it when a dog comes in. They know how to stand on a table. They'll allow you to cut their toenails. They'll allow you to get in their mouths and you know, scrape their teeth if need be. Whatever it, you know needs to be done. Um, so I took it as um, another aspect of training. And um, that's, that one thing just led to another, right? Like I'm doing these competitions with the poodles. I'm going to dog shows showing the Ridgebacks. Then I was helping a friend show her Basenjis. And then I decided maybe I would show a Whippet. Um, I would say it turned into an obsession, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I like the obsessions, though. I mean, they, they lead to great stories. You know, I, yeah. I've been to a, a couple different shows locally, and I always find that the dogs do tend to enjoy the spotlight. Um, well, you, yeah. you do see people, you know, say that they're miserable. I don't think they're miserable. I mean, they're getting, you know, brushed all the time. People are watching them. Mm -hmm. But then you do have that one moment, that element that you said, and I'll relate it to grooming, and that is the dog can tell if you're nervous. And how, exactly. many, how many times do you tell people, your anxiety, the dog is feeding off of it. 
That dog does not yeah. have that anxiety. I'm telling you right now, it's you that has the anxiety. Yeah. You leave, the dog's completely fine. But you're, oh right. no, oh no I, 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 it has to be done really quick because he gets really scared. No, it's, it's yeah. actually you. Yeah, I don't need you here to get your dog groomed. You go somewhere else and, yeah, get it done. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's why we have dogs that are fabulous with emotional support, mm -hmm. dogs that can be, you know, help with canine companions for independence or guide dogs for the blind. You know, dogs know us, I think, sometimes better than we know ourselves. They know what's coming in our emotions. They can smell it. Um, and, uh, you know, the dogs that are at dog shows all the time. Um, if you're new and you're you're nervous, um, they are they start to be hesitant. Uh, they may not allow the judge to touch them, not because they don't want to be touched by the judge, but they think that your nervousness is because of the judge. Mm -hmm. Like, why is that person coming up to us? And so a dog may back up and not want to be touched. Uh, really, really sensitive that way, and that's been part of the my interest in training as well. Um, you know, teaching the dogs, no, this is fun, this is a game, this is something we can do together. Um, and that, those are the dogs that you see shine at the dog show. They do like it. It is something that they've learned to love. And, uh -huh. and, you know, just like somebody learns to love running and someone else is like, I don't even own tennis shoes, right? I mean, it's just... It's life. Sometimes I think the only time I'll ever run is a zombie apocalypse, and most likely I'll be taken down. So, yeah. but, but then I have to realize I, I play basketball and soccer with my daughter, so I actually am running there, so I might actually survive a little bit. <laughs> nice. Now, when it came to your first success, when it was doing yeah. showing, Kind of take mm -hmm. it back to the first part of, okay, now you're starting to actually succeed in this realm. Then you decide, okay, I'm going to take it a next step further. What happened to actually graduate you to move up? Um, well, I, I think tough question because I feel like everything just kind of happens for a reason and everything was a little like one step at a time so um, the very first time that I showed a Rhodesian Ridgeback in the confirmation ring and for the listeners that don't you know really understand what that means is there's a written standard for breeds they're supposed to look a certain way mm -hmm. and when you go to um, a show the judge is judging the dogs based on what the written standard says. So you don't show up to a Ridgeback ring with a spotted Ridgeback. That's not a color in the breed. You don't show up to the um, Golden Retriever ring with a black retriever, right? So um, they're judging based on what the breed is supposed to look like. And so my very first time in the confirmation ring, um, I won. And I'm like, hey! <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm so dumb, right? This is great. I was lucky. I was showing, and sometimes it is luck. Um, I was showing uh, a very nice young female uh, for my friend, and that went very well. So, as with anything in life, when people see me doing well and do, and winning, they either want to jump on board, <laughs> or I want to be a part of that. Hey, can you help me? Which I was lucky enough. That was what happened to me. You know, I'm I'm fairly gregarious. I'm. A, happy person most of the time and so people weren't afraid to approach me and say hey would you like to try and show my dog I'm like yeah I want to you know as much experience as possible so I did graduate from the oh I'm showing dogs for other people because I want experience to oh I'm accepting money um, to show dogs for other people so that I can take my dogs as well and have my expenses paid and um, that was a nice transition for me um, and then I did that for a number of years along with showing my own dog. Then I got to a stage where I was like, you know, I'm having a harder time showing my own dog than by the in the two the early two thousands. I had my own Ridgeback. By then I had had my own litter um, every year. It was called Royal Canaan now, but um, starting in I think it was two thousand or two thousand one, Yukonuba started their uh Yukonuba A K C national show in Orlando. And I went to that for the first time in 2001 with a dog that I bred, and we got what was called an award of excellence. 
I was like, huh, this is pretty cool. And that same dog did really well at our national specialty that year. That was kind of a level up for me. And so then I was like, you know, I kind of, maybe I want to keep breeding. Maybe I want to continue to better the breed and, and continue to have show dogs that I might be able to excel with. Um, and so that was kind of you know, like leveling up, right? Okay, before I showed, now I'm a breeder. Now I'm getting accolades with dogs that I bred, and I've moved through the rankings that way. And it was, you know, around 2009 that I realized I had a dog that was something really special. And that was the biggest leap in levels for me. I was like, I'm going to campaign a dog. I'm going to have a dog that's out in the spotlight. And that's, that's what led me to, uh, to the, big, uh, the rest of the land. Now, I, I really wanted to actually go into that whole campaigning for the dog. What is that like, and what goes into it? Um, well, what goes into it? Uh, money. Yeah. How do you get that money? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not a, it's right. Well, I mean, I'm lucky. I have a career, and um, I also have a husband that has a career. So, um, you know, was, you know, you can spend money here and there. Um, and make decisions on where you're going to spend money and where you don't. But as with anything, you know, life is choices. And I made a choice at that time in my life that I'm going to spend my extra money um, getting this dog to dog shows. Now, again, we're, you know, 18 years into my dog hobby at this point, and um, I now had two children. And so leaving, you know, on a regular basis on the weekends, um, we was trying. That, that was pretty difficult. My husband wasn't all too happy about it. Uh, so I am lucky enough to be uh, friends with a handler here in Utah that um, was able to take my dog for me. And I did pay her. Um, she was absolutely compensated. And, uh, you know, I, I owe him being out in the spotlight to, you know, her being out, her winning, and... Um, and then I was obviously able to show him myself when I could. So, you know, kind of a, a joint venture, per se. I understand. Um, yeah, I mean, is it crazy? Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, but there's, you know, I have friends who have kids who ride horses mm -hmm. and go jumping, right? They just have lessons every week. They're, go they're hauling a horse to, do to horse shows. Mm -hmm. They're doing competitions. They're paying trainers. Uh, it's really not different. What about the people who are into race cars or people who are into making cars? Or You know, it's just, it's my hobby. And, um, yeah, I spend a lot of money making myself happy. How about that? I don't really ever see any kind of problem with it. For the simple fact that, for one, the dog is getting a great life. That's the first one. Second of all, you are having a great life, which ultimately makes the dog have another great life. So it's kind of one of those merry-go-round kind of moments where it just, yes, okay, there's money going into this, but way of life is actually still going well. So that's, that's not a bad thing. I mean, we're talking about a dog who is well taken care of. This is Absolutely. probably better than a lot of kids, sad to say, which is always really hard to think that there are dogs out there, there are cats out there, and there are kids out there who are neglected on a daily basis. So, right. putting your, your money into it, your hard-earned money, it's not like you're saying, well, hey, you know, I get this money for free, and I'm going to put it where we're yeah. <laughs> You earn it. Your husband earns, so you're able to say, well, you know what, we're able to just put a little bit away so I can do this. It's not a bad thing. I mean, everybody yeah. has to have a hobby. But some people like video games. Right. And how much money goes into those little things? I mean, it, it could be yeah. anything. Like that. And we all have our own things, our own passions. So I can, I can yeah. help you get that. Yeah, and, you know, just to, and to clarify, because people will be like, oh, well, you're going to make all that money back in spread fees. <laughs> Uh, really? <laughs> um, well, number one, I don't operate that way. But number two, people, I think they have an unrealis unrealistic expectations of how much a dog would be bred or how much money people pay you to breed to your dog. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't go down that way. 
And while I'm, I'm certainly sure that there are people who have, you know, 20 breeding females at a facility, and of course they would make a ton of money, but those aren't usually dog show people. Those are people who that is their primary income. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a bunch of females at my house. In fact, I have one that has her parts. The others are very old, grumpy dogs. Um, and there's no way in a million years that I would ever have, be able to sell enough puppies to put back the money that I spent. I spent money showing my dog, well, all of my dogs for that matter, because I like it. Mm -hmm. And I want to show people that you can breed good dogs to the standard and they can win. You can do it yourself or you can pay somebody else. But if you don't like it, don't do it, right? Like, that's stupid, but I like it, so I'm doing it. And see, that's that's what matters. You know, again, it, it, way of life is what can we do to tolerate some of the hardships in life. That's, you know, a hobby. And that's yep. a very good hobby because at least you're able to give to a dog a very good life. You know, think about all the people who never get to travel. Your dog traveled more than most people. Me more than me, which is yeah. like, that's amazing. <laughs> if, if, Absolutely. If only it could actually tell the stories of what it was like. So, right. let's fast forward to the big show. When you went to okay. Westminster Kennel Club. Now, that's at Madison Square yeah. Gardens. For one, I've never been, always wanted to go, so I'm very envious to what that was like. So take us to that day and, and kind of take us through what goes on that we never get to see. Um, yeah, it's not all glitz and glamour. And unfortunately for me, the year that I went and competed, I had been there once before as a spectator, and that was quite fun because you can kind of do whatever you want really nearly but when you have a dog there um it's very restrictive and they had a ton of construction going on at madison square garden that year so normally they have what's called a benching area and in the hallways around the lower arena uh, where people would normally you know walk and use the restroom and get up to where their seating is um they would have uh, areas set up that your dog would have to be on display, basically, for anybody to come see them. Hmm. And for the entire day that they're required to show, they have to be there. And if you can't sit there with your dog, you're required to hire a security guard at $45 an hour. Hmm. Yeah. So, and this it's still that way to this day. So, the year that I went, they didn't have the benching area, so all the dogs were just set up in these lines, in their crates. Uh, all the Ridgebacks were in the area, all the Shepherds were in the area, you know, so you know, knew where they were. Um, but it wasn't um, an open show like it, it was before and was for the years afterwards. So I don't know if that's better or not. I think the dogs do get pretty tired being on display, right? Like, if you... If any of, your, um, of the listeners are, do um, trade shows or anything like that, you're on display all day, every day, talking to people, answering questions, pushing your product, whatever it is you do, and the dog would get tired with that. The year I went, luckily, he could you know, be in his kennel, which he you know, is very comfortable with, and he just rested the whole time, and he was perfectly happy. Um, so people don't realize that that can be stressful for the dog. Um, but that Zero is my dog's name. He was not particularly stressed out with that. We were there with some friends. We had a great time, but you never can leave the dog alone. So you're always, you know, in your little area, except for obviously when you go out and show. Um, something that I had no idea about is the night before Westminster started, they had a hockey game in Madison Square Garden. <laughs> So they go from a hockey game the night before to wham bam, here we go. They put um, a a wood, a plywood type flooring down, and it's not firm. It's almost kind of bouncy. Mm -hmm. And so when the dog, and how do you plan for that with a dog? Like I don't walk around trying to find bouncy floors <laughs> for my dog to walk on. So the first time we walked out onto that green carpet that you see on TV, my dog, I saw his feet flatten almost like grabbing the ground, mm -hmm. like, whoa, what, 
is that? And so until he walked on it, you know, for a little while and realized what the feeling was, um, he was, you know, you could see that his feet were a little funny. A dog that doesn't get out, hasn't been trained, and hasn't been traveling, they may not even walk on that. Let alone we walked from our hotel in Manhattan to Madison Square Garden with all the cars, all the people, all the subway vents coming up, and he was fine. He didn't care because he's you know, socialized. Um, but that that was uh, interesting to me. Like, okay, there's all these little weird things. Um, but you're so into the moment of, oh, I'm showing my dog that when you're there, you aren't looking up, right? Like, I wasn't looking up at stands. I wasn't, you know, taking it all in at that time. It was like, hey, I'm at my dog show, and I'm showing my dog like I always do. Um, I found comfort in that. But the other stuff was pretty different. Most people don't have ever see that. I'll tell you, I would have been looking up, and I would have, I would have probably been more the spectator at that point than anything else. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's MSG. It's one of the greatest arenas in the world, and I, I don't know if right. it's the best, but it's it's one of the one of them. And so, it's kind of weird to think that dogs would be even on display because I'm, you know, as you said, it's right. very stressful, and that that yep. to me is just like, huh. Now, <laughs> one thing that drives me absolutely insane, and, and again, I'm, I'm going to jump on a soapbox, is I love the, the sponsors. I love how Prima mm -hmm. is always the number one sponsor in all of these dog show events, and it's so misleading, because people say, yeah. oh, well, every show dog must eat it, because why else would it be on display? <laughs> Please do me a favor and please squash that for me, please, because you you've been in this <laughs> arena. Just please tell the people that they don't eat that. <laughs> yeah, well, there are some that do, obviously. I mean, they have the um, people who get on the, you know, the um, commercials with them, and, and those dogs really do eat ProPlan or, you know, Purina products and such. Um, some dogs do quite well on it, so I, I can't lie and say no, they don't, but they don't all eat it. Um, and it comes down to convenience, too. If you are a handler, which means you, your job is to travel to dog shows and show dogs, and people can make a handsome living doing that, um, it's difficult to have, let's say, 8 or 10 or even 15 or more dogs on your rig and this rig could be a decked out um, Swan Creek is a brand that comes to mind with these amazing semi-trailer um, rigs that have sleeping quarters and five air conditioners and the dogs are, I mean, it's just like, wow, I want to live in here. <laughs> um, but, you know, scooping food for them is easier. Does that mean it's the best option for them? Not always. But, you know, show dogs have to look good. They have to be in great condition. So um, if it's not working for them, obviously they switch. But I doubt they would ever then go back on the TV commercial and say, well, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> I'm no longer feeding that product. Um, but, uh, you know, sponsorships are sponsorships, right? Like, I don't even drink soda, you know, but there's soda commercials, you know, surrounding everything we do, you know, that sort of a thing. So now you got to take it with a grain of salt. But at least if somebody sees a show dog eating a higher end uh, dog food, that's better than them, you know, getting something from, you know, a store. Well, am I allowed to bash a store on your show? You can do show? whatever you want. I, I, <laughs> it's free for speech. Like Walmart brand or, yes. Yeah, Walmart brand. Some, some crap plastic food that's just all fillers and, and stuff. And But, you know, the sad thing is, is something like that can be fine for some dogs, too, right? Like, you know, i got to watch what I eat. i got to cut out as much fat as possible. I've, you know, been dealing with my... Um, 
my LDL and on my uh, cholesterol being a little bit high, so I'm watching some of the things that I eat. And then you see the person who, you know, all they eat are French fries and drink beer, they're lean, their cholesterol's great, their heart's pumping like <laughs> a machine, or like, okay, whatever. So the same thing happens in dogs. But yeah, not, not everybody sees what they advertise on TV. <laughs> um, most people try and uh, do best by their dogs, but... Uh, some people can only afford just what they can afford, so that's what it is. When I look at whenever I've ever watched any um, dog show, and I, I love watching it because I love seeing all the different dogs, and especially the ones that I never get to see, I always think to myself, yeah, there's, there's so much money has to go into this. I mean, just, just down to even the handler itself, you have to look... 100% professional, which means your clothes have to be well taken care of. They have to be really a specific way. So you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're really dressed up for all the men are in suits. Absolutely. Women are in really nice, you know, um, I, I really don't have the, the terminology of women's clothes, I'm sorry, but um, I mean, a nice dress. <laughs> That's right. What are you saying? Women, women's suits, absolutely. Well, yeah. Um, there's a... Uh, you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's the same garbage. But yeah, I and mean, it's all perception, right? You want to be respected, you have to command respect. Right. That's right. I, I look at it, I, I always, every time I've ever been part of these things where I, I'll go in and I'll see these, these hammers, I always think to myself, here, well taken care of, well groomed, the dog is gorgeous. There's a lot of money that goes into that alone. So I always think there's just no way that you're going to eat garbage food. Here the dogs, you'll see their teeth, they're nice and white, that's not a dry kibble. You'll see the coat is really nice, that's not a dry kibble. Um, and of course, and, you know, again, I know Troy is listening, laughing as, as I say this, because he knows <laughs> everything that I ever talk about always goes back to nutrition. And Absolutely. It's, it's, it's how it works out. I mean, how can you... Yeah. You, you see these dogs, standard poodle, same thing. If your standard poodle yeah. is not eating quality food, what's going to happen? Yeah. So that's, that's why I was Absolutely. No, yeah. don't the Ridgebacks. Because, yeah. you know, I am completely, like I told you, I never get to actually play with them. I never get to see them. Tell us about their temperament. Well, so remember back, you know, 20 minutes ago when I said that, um, you know, the standard poodles are compliant and they want to do things over and over again. So let's do a complete 180 <laughs> and talk about the Rhodesian Ridgeback. I have to admit, sadly, that I was not ever able to get an obedience title on my first Ridgeback that I trained to compete with. Um, so the score is a 200. That would be a perfect score. And for those of us that have done um, any kind of obedience style training with Ridgebacks, we joke that a Ridgeback is either going to score a 200, which is perfect, or a 2. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't know which on what day. <laughs> and that comes with, I, I believe, being extra smart, questioning why they're doing something, and thinking you're crazy. Um, my dogs definitely think I'm crazy sometimes when I'm like, all right, come on, let's go outside. And they're like, yeah, but it's cold out there. Mm-hmm. I don't care if it's cold, get outside. And, you, you know, you have to wait, come on, let's go. And they go. They, they're like the perpetual junior high school students. They're going <laughs> to test you. You know, you taught them something, they understand it, then they want to put a twist on it. So you tell your dog to sit, and they kind of look at you like, huh, can you use that in a sentence? <laughs> like, seriously? And so you say it again, help the dog respond, and they do. You tell them they're great, and then you say, okay, let's do that again, sit. And then, again, they look at you like, I just did that. We were both standing here. Did you not see me sit? It's a very different well, it's a hound mentality. So, again, when I compare to the poodle, that's my experience, so I apologize to those of you with retrievers and such, um, or other breeds of dogs. My life is hounds right now, and my life is I manage the dogs 
we have rules that I have to be really strict on, that I have to require them to respond to, and they do understand the difference between the safety commands, like when I say come, they have to come right to me. When I say here, that means can you get over here by where I am? I need to be able to keep track of you. So they understand the difference, and they're very smart about their responses that way. They learn very quickly that they bore easily. So when you do a group class, wherever you do your group class, you'll usually see the Ridgeback catching on in the first couple of tries, and then the owner is like, is seriously like fighting with them for the next 10 minutes while everybody else is practicing the same behavior, and your dog's like, seriously? We already did that. <laughs> so having a little bit of uh, the ability to let things go is nice um, when owning a Ridgeback because it can be a bit aggravating in that respect. Um, but that doesn't make them stupid by any means. I think it makes them smarter because they're questioning things. Um, but as far, so as far as obedience goes, um, just uh, difficult, right? Like, they, they want to have some say. And when you give them a little bit of say, then they're happy. But if you give them, there's a slippery slope, you give them too many options, they're not going to choose the same option that you would choose. They're, gonna, they're very self-serving. So probably um, and I, it's best to say that a Ridgeback is not good for somebody who has never owned a dog before. Uh, uh, yes, uh, especially somebody who just in, in their regular life is not, doesn't have high expectations of most things. And what I mean by that, and I'll just, like, when people email me, like, hey, you know, I'm thinking about a Ridgeback, blah, blah, blah. I'll say, you know, if you have a little bit of an OCD side to your personality, perfect match. Because you're not going to let things go. You're going to be require the same behavior every single time. If you're the kind of person that sometimes thinks that you're going to get away with, sometimes I'll let you on the couch, sometimes I don't. Sometimes we do this, sometimes we don't. The Ridgeback will completely take over the entire situation, and they will wear you down. Like my 17-year-old daughter. <laughs> she will wear me down until she gets what she wants. I swear she learned it from the dog. Um, they, they can be very hard-headed with that respect, and that can be very difficult for somebody who really should have gotten a Labrador or a Golden Retriever or a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Those are great little dogs. Um, there are so many other breeds that are also cool and athletic and uh, protective like a Ridgeback is, yet far more compliant. And uh, if you make a mistake, they don't hold it against you. Um, I, I tell people also that every time you allow your Ridgeback to get away with a behavior that you don't like, they go in their kennel and they mark it on the wall. I bet you reclined in the back, you'd see a little tally mark. And then uh, they may do something right 99 times, and then that one time they don't, and you let them get away with it, they're like, uh, oh, I see. <laughs> Watch this trick. <laughs> that's yeah, cool. so they're humbling, humbling to say the least. But that's hound. If people would just research what hounds do, they're meant to hunt on their own. And then the hunter would catch up behind them, what did you track, right? Like, so you track large game, and they take down some sort of a, an elk, you know, something in Africa, but they're not elk, but they might be called something else, I don't know. Um, or if they're tracking lions, and they get there, and they hold them at bay, they would hunt with, four, you know, five ridgebacks or so. The, the hunter would show up, like, hey, what'd you do? <laughs> not, I'm telling you where to go, and I'm telling you what to do. The, the hounds, all hounds, are bred to hunt not at their the hunter's side. They're said to be out front and do their job and then the hunters would catch up. So people don't really realize that's what they were bred to do. And so when they want to do things on their own, it's just natural for them. They're not waiting for you to give them the the cue, go retrieve my dead bird. Well, plus they wouldn't do that anyway. They'd be like, oh, awesome. And then they pluck it, run around with it, and say, thank you. Thank you. So that's what food rides best. That yeah. is definitely. Uh, now, of course, I always have to ask the, the question about nutrition. As I said, that's one of my yeah. favorite things ever. Nutritional mm -hmm. uh, benefits or requirements. 
that a wage back needs on a daily basis is what? Um, they need an owner who understands that despite being a large breed dog and despite what the bag, if they're feeding out of a bag, despite what the bag says for what their dosage or what their amount they should be eating is, um, they have a very slow metabolism and they are very prone to being obese. Um, let's say a typical high quality brand of dog food would say a hundred pound dog should be eating five to six cups of food a day. A hundred pound Ridgeback is likely to only be eating two and a half to three cups a day. That's how slow their metabolism is. My own observation or my own theory on this is that because when they were, this could be totally crazy, but it's just my theory. They didn't get to eat every day when they were, you know, making this breed in Africa. They only get to eat when there's a kill. Mm -hmm. So their metabolism is slow so that they don't, you know, starve in between meals. That doesn't mean they don't act like they're starving all the time. They do. But they certainly do not need um, a bunch of food. They just have a slower metabolism. So with that, they have to get the highest quality nutrition that they can get in a smaller amount. Um, they are a short haired dog that doesn't have much of an undercoat so they're prone to dry skin they have to have something that is high in omega fatty acids whether it be fish oil pills or fish oil itself um, there, you know, some people give flax oil you know, something that's going to give them a high quality omega fatty acid in their diet is going to keep their skin in shape and then of course that makes their coat shiny and nice as well that's an absolute must you know like do not pass go do not collect two hundred dollars <laughs> which backs need you know fatty acids in their diet um they are pigs for the most part and don't do a lot of chewing of their food they just inhale it um so they need to have things that they can clean their teeth on um Troy would obviously attest to this, and I've had the best luck with it. You know, raw bones that they can chew on, um, or if your dog will chew on synthetic bones, they can do that too. Mine won't. They're like, that's not real. I'm not chewing on it. <laughs> okay. Um, so they they get their raw bones on a regular basis. That's how they, you know, I keep their teeth clean. That's something to watch on a Ridgeback. And then, um, go ahead. Will you ask something? No. Oh, sorry, he just took a breath, sorry. Um, and I supplement um, my dogs. Um, I do I do not see 100% raw diet. Sorry, Troy, but I'm getting there. Um, you know, I, <laughs> um, and that's mainly because of time. Uh, you know, it's, I'm leaving the house at 7 o'clock in the morning. I have seven dogs that I'm trying to get fed and take, taken care of. And so it's something that's faster for me in the morning is what works. But I am... You know, supplementing uh, fish oil. I am giving them probiotics with every meal. I really do understand that processed dog food is not doing the right thing in their guts. And for those of us that have Ridgebacks, we know that they actually have a pretty sensitive gut. They try to make you believe that they can eat anything and they will try to, um, but it doesn't always come out the other end the way you want it to. And so giving them a really high quality probiotic is very helpful in um, keeping their, their bowels the way they're supposed to be. Just supposed to be. Um, you know, a lot of the protein sources in uh, processed dog foods are not really what we think they are. And so, you, you know, Ridgebacks can be prone to getting hives. And is it the fillers that are putting in there? Is it the protein source? Um, paying attention to those sorts of things. Um, with their diet is really important. Not flip flopping around, not giving them a bunch of extra stuff. Um, they usually do the best when you, you, know, you keep them on a, a pretty regular diet, high quality with you know, omegas and um, and um, probiotics and you know, other things here and there as needed. And see, that's one thing I always like to hear it from other people because I'm always preaching this and I'm pretty sure you'll be sick and tired of me saying it. That's why I like to have different people come on and, you know, say the same thing. It's like, look, I may be, you know, barking about this every week, but it's the fact. 
And you know, when you mention the fact that here's a dog that you know comes from South Africa, it's it's not going to have that ice cold climate, and it's going to have a lot of wide open areas to hunt. I mean, there's definitely a lot of different things to hunt. So it, yep. it's going to be able to to exercise, but then we yeah. bring them into our normal world. And we have our normal lives, and you know, you have a bit, very busy life as well, so you can attest to this. It's the one thing that we tend to overlook a lot, and that's the exercise. And I know in training, you probably see that as well. So please just kind of give us a little insight on exercising, especially Ridgeback. Yeah. Well, the first thing I want to say is there is some misconception on the amount of exercise that they need. Um, the, again, I'm going to go back to the hound thing because know your breeds, right? If you have a terrier, you've got to know that they're tenacious, they're going to dig, they're going to be fiery, they're going to... They act the way they do because of the, the, what they were purposefully bred for. Which that's being a hound. Um, people go, oh, well, they're from Africa, so they're going to, you know, love the heat. Well, I mean, they didn't hunt in the heat of the day. That's <laughs> stupid. Right? They may, like, lay out on the deck when it's warm, but in the heat of the day, they're not out exercising, and they do overheat. Mm -hmm. They can overheat, actually, quite easily. Well, I think any breed can, but they don't like that. And they're not a huge water dog, so they're not seeking water to cool themselves like some water dogs would be. Shade obviously helps. But, um, you know, I get out, I do exercise, but I am not out running the miles every day with a Ridgeback because my Ridgebacks need exercise. I'm lucky I have a large piece of property behind my home um, that I can allow my dogs to run free on. And that is the best kind of exercise for them, running free, you know, turning corners, bouncing around, jumping over each other. Um, that seems to be mentally the best stimulant for them. Physically, they're staying in shape. But this isn't hours a day. And if I don't feel like going, they're not standing at the door with the leash in their mouths waiting to go. If I sit on the couch, they curl up on the couch next to me. If I decide I need to take a nap, they're on the bed before I am. So they are really good at being what you need them to be. And so I tell you know, puppy people that, or people even just that want education about Ridgeback, when they um, ask me about it, I'm like, well, if you run a Ridgeback 10 miles a day, they're going to need 10 miles a day. Right? Like, if you run 10 miles a day, you need 10 miles a day. You build up your endurance, and that's what you need to feel your rush. Mm -hmm. um, if you get your reach back out a few days a week, um, but you are giving them mental stimulation on the other days, whether it's getting them to do some command or just actually just being with them or talking to them or even following them in the back seat of the car while you run to the bank, that's mental stimulation. They're actually quite happy with that. They don't need to be run to death. Um, some of them like it, but mine seem perfectly happy with my I'll exercise when I feel like it routine. I will not fall as fortunate as Troy to be able to do those hikes. I, I envy him when right. he those, those pictures. I'm like, oh my gosh. I don't know if I yeah. can keep up with them, but um, I mean, that, that's, that's an exercise that I look at and go, man, I just, I wish I could say I had the endurance for it, but that's a rough one. But I, I like the fact that you understand the breed and you understand the limitations too. I mean, I'm sure that, again, being able to train them, being able to show them, obviously weight is a concern whenever you have to go to those competitions because you're redeemed for it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, and, and um, I'm, I'll drag Troy into this. Um, I showed up in uh, Las Vegas this fall to show his dog, who was fired by one of mine, and I was like, oh, my gosh, Troy, seriously? The dog's a big, fat cow. <laughs> he's like, no, no, he's, he's, he's in great shape, he looks great. I'm like, yeah, he's in great shape, but he's in great shape, and he needs to lose 20 pounds. Oh, he's he's like, oh. I know, well, he's okay. Troy's a man. He jumped right on that and, you know, cut back, back his dog food. He didn't have to change his exercise routine. He, he kept up with that. But, um, you know, we just have to be cognizant of, of, of what's in front of us. And, yeah, when you're doing the show dog thing, the dog, it's like, 
It's like running a Ragnar and not being in shape. You're not. It's not going to be fun if you think you're going to die. Mm. It's not going to be so fun to do a dog show and lose after all, spending all that money because your dog hasn't, you know, is flabby or is overweight. It changes their appearance. It doesn't make them look like they fit the standard. Um, I promise you, when Zero and I went to Westminster, or well, he was in far better shape than I was because he had been out showing um, with his handler. They biked him every day. He was a rock. I mean, he looked like a million bucks. And uh, that's, that's why he won. He won because he was at the top of his game. And that's pretty normal for any competition. You know, and I, I will definitely throw myself in front of the bus on this one. With our, with our Akita, I, I I know she did gain a little bit more weight. Um, she is well fed, and so she didn't have I would say that excessive size to her. She just had more of a filled out look, which she is. Once, once she went into raw feeding, she changed to a whole different dog. And I, uh, I right away realized, oh man, my wife and I both looked at each other and said, okay, we were obviously going a little bit too much on the food, so we did cut back, and we found that perfect silence between it, and it can be a challenge. That is a definite challenge. Now, I have to ask the question about Zero, the name. I'm, I'm going to go with Night yeah. Before Christmas. But I could be wrong. Yes, absolutely. Um, no, you're right. So he was born. He was born on Christmas Eve, 2007. Oh. So he'll be 11 this year. He just turned 10. And um, the theme for the litter, so all the dogs were registered, and we decided to have a theme of Christmas movies. <laughs> so um, that's why he was Nightmare Before Christmas. There's a One Magic Christmas. And um, a, you know all the the famous movies that you know, people chose different movies, but um, I chose that actually not having ever even seen it, and I'm I get a little freaked out by some of the Tim Burton movies, so <laughs> I'm totally throwing that out there. Um, I have seen the movie now, but I do still get a little freaked out by Tim Burton movies. Um, they're just a little creepy for me, but um, Zero was a cute little ghost dog on there, and I'm glad that my, my cute little Zero, who's not little at all, has that name. But yeah, that's where it came from. I guess. I was, I was like, I, okay, Zero, there's really only one character out there. I don't actually think there's another character named Zero in, in animation, and I watch a great deal of cartoons. Um, not, not because I have a daughter, just because I never did grow up. Um, and I, oh. I love Tim Burton. I, I think that he's got the most morbid kind of creativity out there. Um, but it is, yeah. it is really strange. I mean, I'll, and I'll, I'll go completely off topic here, but I think still Charlie and the Chocolate Factory that he did was the yeah. weirdest. <laughs> that was, yeah. that was way, way, way bizarre. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great name, and, and I think that it's a perfect theme. So that was cool. Yeah. Well, you know, and the funny thing is, is again, in competition, it's not all, you know, rainbows and unicorns. There's people who, you know, they're jealous or they don't like your style of dog. Or, yeah, it's, you know, people think that dog show people are weird, and if you ever have the chance to watch Best in Show, it's hilarious. And, yes, it is very much like that in uh, many on many levels. But... Um, when people, you know, when you're winning, people want to take you down. And Zero was actually referred to um, by a few of his um, haters uh, as the Nightmare Dog. <laughs> I like it, man. Like, seriously. Yeah, seriously kiss my butt. <laughs> but that was good. <laughs> so creatively, the Nightmare Dog. I mean, that's <laughs> <right. laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean he's in your nightmares winning? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's such a well play on words. I mean, I... Uh, I think uh, that's the music. Music. What? <laughs> oh my gosh, that is just perfect. I would totally yeah. put that somewhere. I would have a, a plaque made or something because that's... That is the greatest nickname ever. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe I'll just play uh, Alice Cooper's Welcome to My Nightmare next time I see somebody or something like that. You know, why is that? Why is it that when a dog comes out, they don't get their own signature music? 
You know, just like that. I mean, it, when they do the lap around, you, know, you do a couple of those little laps. I mean, honestly, I think that would be kind of cool. But, you know. It would be super cool. Yes, it would be super cool. Yes, yeah, just one of those things. I mean, you know, and I, I'll, I'll say this. From my, my own perspective of going to different shows, and a lot of times when I did, when I would go, I'd go right up here to Polina, which, I'll tell you, that was killer to walk into that place just because of the name. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was hard for me. <laughs> but, you know, they have a gorgeous facility. I'm not going to, I won't yeah. take that away from them. Um, Absolutely. I would, I would talk to different people that were part of it, and, you know, it is a, a different universe. There's no doubt about that. But mm-hmm. they're all passionate about one thing, and that is the dogs. And I've got to give them that. Yep. So, it's true. is there anything that we haven't covered that we really, you know, definitely should cover before we actually sign off for this episode? Um, you know, I, I think if we were going to backtrack to to the soapbox um, world um, as far as you know, my statement on um, you know, taking responsibility and, and not and making sure if you're a breeder that um, you, know, you guys aren't ending up in rescue because you don't care about them after you cash the check. I mean, that's a, that's a huge problem. But as consumers, um, people are really falling victim to the um, adopt don't shop. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's dangerous. I think that if you, if you have, have a little amount of um, experience with dogs, it, it doesn't always work out so well to adopt. Sometimes you are adopting someone else's problem. Sometimes you are taking on or biting off something that's more than you can chew. Um, I, I don't. I want people to understand that they shouldn't be guilted into going and, and adopting a dog. If they have an idea in their mind of a temperament that they're interested in, a dog that will fit their lifestyle, and um, for that matter, you know, is a look that they're attracted to, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. If you do your research and you find somebody who has, you know, a, a dog that you are interested in, um, they're a reputable breeder, they'll, they'll offer you a guarantee, they'll stand behind your dog, they'll answer questions, they'll be there for you. I, I don't think that people should feel guilty about that. I really, I, I really think that people need to make decisions based on their ability and not based on guilt. Uh, that's becoming a huge problem and that would be my other because Ridgebacks are a pretty cool breed I'll, I've talked plenty of people out of them um, because I know that they won't fit their lifestyle I get people who ask me about uh, rescues all the time um, and I've had a lot of people that I've turned down for rescues mm-hmm. because no this isn't you don't want this problem you're not it's not going to work for your family um, and then you know I help them find somebody who has a young dog that they can you know form their own right so Anyway, that'd be that'd be my last little soapbox comment. Well, I told you the soapbox is is one of the most um, I don't know. It's 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 the one that gets in there, and it, it's I, I have no idea how that that whole idea came out one day, but it just started one day. I, was, I don't know. Even Troy, a week later after he did the podcast, he sent me a message. He goes, you know, I'm still thinking about that. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it's it's something that uh, well, maybe maybe we should change maybe we should change the name to like Passion Box or something. But, uh, that sounds a little weird. I I still, <laughs> like, you know, I still like the the soapbox because you know you look back to the origin of what it, what a soapbox and that whole thing was, and it, it was kind of entertaining. So you know you just think back to I want to say it was the twenties that so would stand on a soapbox just to get attention to a large crowd around, and that's how they would gravitate. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. That sounds good. Sounds good. Oh, well, okay. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Good for me. <laughs> and you know, it's funny because you, you mentioned something that really hit home to, to me as well, and that is when it comes to denying uh, an adoption, it does happen. And it happens more often than I think people really understand. I personally and my wife have declined people to actually rescue different fosters we've had. And that's because we realize they're not going to go to the right home. We realize that maybe these people are just not the right fit for these particular cats. Maybe they're, they're a kitten and they're mm-hmm. older 
How are they going to be able to handle that cat? Will it you know, trip them up when they're walking? Will they be able to maintain mm -hmm. that? Will their skin even be able to handle if, a, if the claws actually you know, scratch them? We, and, and I, when I say we, I mean even you, anybody in rescue, we're obligated to actually think ahead because we understand what they're getting. Maybe they don't understand completely. It is right. our responsibility to try to explain and educate them on, hey, you know what, maybe this particular dog, this particular cat, this particular whatever, may not be right for you. I understand you want something to actually be a companion, and that's fine, but this is not that companion for you. Yeah. So, and as a foster, there's so much emotion behind the fear of failing them. You know that somebody failed them before, and you, you know, in essence, are are their savior, mm -hmm. and you become responsible for making sure it doesn't happen again. So, yeah, it, it there's a ton of emotion in that. And people, not everybody, well, most people don't realize that. So, you know, I mean, most of the ones that we, we do get, um, I would say probably 95% were just abandoned as kittens. So that's, okay. that's kind of one of those, you know, they, they never really had anything but abandonment. So it's yeah. just a matter of finding them in the right place. You know, obviously, Declaw, we are 100% against you. are not allowed to Declaw. Um, and the other thing that we, we really don't want to see, especially because it's the Midwest, is indoor-outdoor cats. Um, it, it, it's kind of rough. I mean, when you get down to zero degrees or below that, if a cat is outside or a dog is outside, I mean, they're not supposed to be. Come on. Well, yep. I, I unfortunately think that we're done with this episode, which makes me sad because I'm enjoying myself. I'm enjoying listening to your stories. I always have a million more stories. So always um, if you ever want to, you know, if you want to have a discussion about uh, junior high school English, um, I could keep you going for like five hours. Uh, I'll tell you, I, you know, coaching youth sports. Um, right now I have second graders in our basketball team with my third grader, uh, being the only third grader. It is weird to talk to a second grader now knowing that I have a third grader and the last basketball team were fourth and third graders. So it's, that's, that's in its own self. Kids that are at that age, ugh, I don't know. Right. I don't yeah. know kids, kids and dogs. Yeah, kids and dogs, man. They they go hand in hand, and then they make us crazy on the next breath, and uh, well, it's right. <laughs> it is true, though. But if you actually look at it, though, kids and dogs, they are they're the best judge of people, and they get the most pleasure of anything because they're funny and they're real and they're honest. And for that reason, yep. I wouldn't want my life to be anything but. But I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to handle teaching. No. That's not my not, not my not my speed. Sorry to say. Uh, well, uh, that's in your next life. Maybe, but I don't think I don't know, maybe three or four lives down the road. Well okay. Okay. any last words you want to say before we go? No, no, just thank you again for um, letting me be a part of your program there and um yeah, just Keep on keeping on, as Joe Dirt would say. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I like that. And you know, I, do, I, I like that movie. Joe Dirt was funny. Joe Dirt too, a little, little bit of a stretch, but it was still funny. Yeah. Well, fun time. I'm Chris Green. Have a pet-tastic week. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay, gotta go in my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs>